My name is Donna Hittrich. I'm part of the faculty at Columbia Business School, and I'm very grateful to uh, Robert Smith and Vista for arranging this important topic today, and also for my colleagues at Columbia who are here today, Glenn Hubbard and everyone else who came down for this really important topic. So we'll start off with you, Betty. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how the heck did you get here? So I'm an operating principal at Vista. I've been at the firm for about 11 years. I've worn a bunch of different hats. So I, like Robert, started out my career after going to the other business school, Yale, um, as an investment banker. And then, and I worked with Robert at Goldman Sachs in technology. Yeah. I actually took a couple of years off after I left Goldman Sachs. And so I lived in Maui, I learned to surf, I traveled around the world. Um, and I tell that story because I want people to understand there isn't a path. Like, right. you're not necessarily, like I never knew I was gonna work at Vista Equity Partners as an operating principal. Um, I went from Maui to being a CFO of a software company. I went from being a CFO of a software company to joining Vista, which had only formed in 2000. It didn't exist when I started my career. And then even at Vista, over the last 10 years, I've worn a bunch of different hats. I mean, I um, had responsibility for working with companies. I was a CFO in the portfolio for a little while. I ran something that we created called Vista Consulting Group, which again, didn't exist when I started my career. And so what I say to people is, um, you know, keep an open mind and, and be part of the journey and be super present. And then I think Chris and Teresa talked a lot about taking risk. I think it's about um, just being open to new opportunities because you don't know what's gonna come uh, next for you. So it's not Groundhog Day, right? It's, it's not, not the same Groundhog. day at Goldman Sachs, day in and day out. You just don't know what's gonna happen. Right. And so, you know, I say like, Always try to challenge yourself. Always try to surround yourself with the best people, work with the best people, have the best people working for you, and new things will happen and occur. And I think just be open to those opportunities. Hi, hey, Stephanie. So I had a pretty, yeah, I had a pretty unusual kind of career path to get to venture, mm -hmm. although I think it's funny because most venture capitalists don't have one kind of standard resume. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I, I had three almost different careers before I went to business school. I started my career at Accenture as a more traditional management consultant. I also didn't travel at all. In fact, I, most of my clients were right up and down Park Avenue. I worked with the financial services uh, division. I then went to Estee Lauder. I did marketing for a number of years in the cosmetics industry. Um, then I went to a startup. And I, I in, in, during that kind of, in that transition before I went to the startup, I actually toyed with going back to school for psychology. And I took a bunch of classes at NYU just to see if that was something that I would want to pursue full time. And what I realized was I was pretty happy being in business and I wanted to stay in business. Um, so after going to the startup that I was at for about two years here in, in New York, I realized that to kind of get to the next level in my career, business school would be an important option for me. And I knew that I wanted to do something at the intersection of business and technology, but I wasn't exactly sure what I thought venture was interesting. Um, and I applied to Columbia early, thinking I was going to spend the rest of my life in New York. And so life doesn't always take you where you think it will be. And I ended up as a lifelong East Coaster and almost decade in New York moving to the Valley after school. Um, and I joined my firm, which was then called Soft Tech BC, now we're called Uncork Capital, um, a few months after I graduated, and I've been there ever since. Um, when I joined, I was told there wasn't even clear that we were going to be able to raise the fund we were raising. We thought we would. Um, there was never any path to partner there, and a couple years ago I became a partner. And so my career's taken a lot of zigs and zags. Um, you know, the reality is you don't know where it's gonna take you, and I, every step along the way, though, I've tried to figure out how is this gonna help me get to where I ultimately want to be, and where I ultimately am doesn't necessarily um, have to be the name that I think it's gonna be, what, you know, why my, my career and my, my field will evolve, but, you know, having a lot of different varied experiences are things I've been able to pull to through, throughout my career. How about you, Renee? Um, so, Unlike, unlike Betty and Stephanie, I actually had the most boring, traditional, straight line path to where I am today, which is co-heading a $500 million fund within Vista. Um, and, and I actually attribute it to something that, that I've always grown up with, with, which is this desire to really break the mold. So when I was five years old, I was playing with marbles and transformers when my you know friends were playing with Barbies. When I was 12 years old, I was playing on an all-boys ice hockey team. I was the only girl. 
in the locker room changing with all these boys. And so it just didn't ever phase me when, you know, I went to, I actually went to Columbia for undergrad. I didn't go to business school. Um, it didn't phase me when I looked at the investment banking industry and saw that it was a male dominated industry. I said, well, okay, this is exactly, you know, this is what I can do. And then it didn't phase me at all when I came to Vista, actually, shortly after Betty. She was the first female hire. It didn't phase me that this was a firm that was dominated by men. And it, I didn't even think twice when Roberts asked me um, and gave me the opportunity to, to co-head a fund and run a fund of this size that no other woman has done. And I think that all has to do with the fact that I've just always believed in breaking the mold and, and not following the standard. So let me ask a question, though. I mean, it, it's, education now is so very expensive, business school and everything else, you know. And uh, maybe we have sort of survivorship bias. It all worked out for us, and we took varied paths. But how did you get the sort of the courage of your convictions when you made that, that switch? Because it sounds great to, you know, you worked, you traveled, you did this, and now we're all sitting here. But I, I can imagine there must have been some times of indecision, or how did you kind of propel yourself to that next, next spot? So for me, I think you guys heard uh, Chris's story about how she's very impatient, and she's also a leap before you sort of think person, and I think I have a little bit of that as well. I, um, you know, I am always looking for the most interesting new opportunity, and I think I had from a very early age just the confidence that I wasn't going to starve to death. Mm. Like I didn't actually know what I was going to grow up and be, but um, having you know gone to business school, having done investment banking. I had the confidence in my skills that I would always be able to find a job, even if it was going to be at Starbucks as a barista. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, part of it was just looking for new opportunities that I was excited about, where I was going to learn and have a lot of fun. Um, and I tell Robert all the time, like, I, I love what I do. I'm having fun, and I'm going to keep doing this until it's not fun, which is why, by the way, every couple years, just like Teresa, he moves me to a new job because it's always fun. <laughs> Um, and I like the challenge. And I think that it is a little bit survivorship, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also like when I left Goldman Sachs and I went to travel and not work for a couple years, I just knew that I would be able to find a job that I enjoyed when I was done with doing that. Um, and I think that that was, for me, how I got through that. So, you know, two, so two things. Uh, I went to business school a little later. I, mm -hmm. was, I wasn't old, but I was certainly on the older end of my class. And I had had, like I said, I had a couple of careers beforehand. A lot of the opportunities that were open to me and my classmates coming out were, were actually jobs that I had already had. And so I kind of knew going in I was going to take a, a less traditional path because otherwise I'd kind of would be, you know, I knew, you know, eventually the MBA would get me further, but I didn't necessarily want to take the path that would hold me for a few years kind of a little bit more steady mm -hmm. to where I was coming from. Um, but more importantly, I looked at you know, friends that went into consulting and banking, and they did it for a few years to figure out where they wanted to go. I knew where I wanted to be headed. And I looked at that as sort of just a holding pattern. And, and I sensed, and it was, it's been interesting, I think, being I think technology and startups have been um, even more of a path, especially here in New York. And, and folks are excited to get into them now. Um, two years out, it was it was crazy to me how many of my classmates were coming to me trying to figure out how to make the transition from the worlds they were in into the startup world. And so I, I was able to, I think, recognize in myself that I didn't necessarily want to pursue what the path that a lot of people found themselves on. And also, you know, I looked at, you know, I, I made the mistake, um, and no offense to anybody who's worked at McKinsey, but I, I did find my way into like the McKinsey interview process um, my second year because it felt like something I should do. It was open to me. And I, and I remember meeting partners there and thinking to myself, this isn't the right, this is not mm -hmm. where I want to end up. Mm -hmm. And so why, why even pursue something for a brief period of time if this isn't the ultimate goal? And so I think for me it was really recognizing what things I valued out of the work and career I wanted to have and how do I set myself on that path, even if it, it would be painful in the short term taking that more non-traditional path. How about you, Renee? Well, so I didn't go to business school, but I, um, I had always planned to go to business school. So I actually joined Vista with the intention of just working there for two years and then going to business school. And it was really um, in my, my second year as I was going through my business school applications when I was given the opportunity to stay. And to not just stay, but to actually help launch a new fund within Vista with a couple other partners. 
it was a scary proposition because Vista at that time had only been a single firm, and this mm -hmm. is the first time that they're doing something that is an offshoot. And we were told by our limited partners that this is, you know, other firms had tried this before, they have failed, and you guys are taking a huge risk by doing this. And the, the biggest decision point for me that really um, that was helpful was my parents, who t basically told me, don't be afraid to fail. That's okay. you know, ultimately what has to happen, is that if you aren't afraid to fail, then you're going to be willing to take the risks to try new things to really push yourself. And you know, they said, look, if you fail, you can always come home and stay at home, and we'll cook for you and support you. <laughs> and so having, having that safety net and not being afraid to, to fail is, is actually how you ultimately propel yourself forward. Uh, uh, uh. I got a law degree, and that was my fallback before I went to business school. I knew I could always do house closings. But, um, you know, the, the, well, I, well, it's interesting because I knew myself, right? And I knew that I was risk averse to know that if I didn't have something to fall back on, I wouldn't move forward. So I think that's where I think I want to go next with this is how do you get to really know yourself? You know what I mean? And technology and the world moves so quickly today. You know, do, do you have a belly barometer? I mean, I think, Betty, you talked about it that you, you were in a situation and just like, this isn't, this isn't going to work out. Stephanie mentioned it. This was just not good for me. Do, do you rely on your belly barometer? How do you get some quiet time to really just... So to say, okay, you know, does this make sense? I think it's harder and harder today. I mean, I moved across country with no job, two suitcases, and very, very, very little money in my bank account when I graduated business school. And I knew those loans were due very soon after I left. Um, I, I have always believed in myself. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I realized, and, and I, you know, I work, I do very early stage investing. I'm investing in seed stage companies. Um, it's the same thing I tell founders when I meet them. It just takes one person to believe in you. Right. Um, you've got it, but if you don't believe in yourself, that, that like right. no one will believe in you. And so, uh, you know, over I I um, I take huge risks. Um, I took huge risks in my own career. I take huge risks in the type of companies I'm backing. I think I, you know, to have the stomach to do early stage investing means you have to be a little bit irrational and believe you're going to see the world a little differently. Um, I, there's rarely any real numbers for me to look at when I, when I back companies. I'm really backing people. And I'm backing people that see the world very differently. That's why they're starting companies and challenging the status quo. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, I, I think there's a there's a narrow group of people that they're willing to take that much risk and do what I do. And there's moments you wake up and you're terrified. <laughs> um, you know, you put a term sheet down and you wonder like, is this the right? Did I make the right call or not? And, you know, you'll know probably pretty quickly if it's not going to work. But it takes you seven to ten years to actually know if it's going to work at the stage that I do. So. You know, for me, it's believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. Find the one person that will then believe in you, and then it's just take it one step at a time. Yeah. I was going to say, gut, gut and intuition is something I really rely heavily on. Betty and I actually work in, um, in an industry where it's actually very data-driven and very analytical. But when it comes to my own career, I really go with my gut intuition. If you think about the, the finance industry, the tech industry, it has gotten a lot of really bad publicity recently when it comes to gender inequality, sexual harassment. But I wouldn't be discouraged by that because while the industry has a long ways to, to go and, and there's still a lot of room for improvement, I think it's actually come a long ways. And um, there are really good people out there and there are many firms and leaders who who are enlightened. And so when it comes to you know, looking for what you do next in your career, really use your gut and really do your research and take a look at um, finding opportunities where you feel like you're going to be able to thrive, not just as a female, but as an individual. Um, you know, don't, don't kind of be a victim and, and then complain about it, right? Mm -hmm. Life's too short to work with jerks. And so you know, if, if, there's, if there's a problem and you feel like there's inequality or you're being harassed, do something about it. If you can't, if you don't want to be vocal, you don't want to be public about it, then leave and put your talent somewhere else and, and really trust your gut. Yeah, yeah I think um, this is a great panel because there's so much diversity and sort of different people's perspective. I feel like, so I'm not an investor. I work with our portfolio companies. I sit on the boards of 10 technology companies. And my responsibility is to make sure that we execute value creation, right? So I am the 
most risk averse from a sort of job <laughs> perspective of these guys. I don't have to make investment decisions. I just have to fix the company. And my companies are, you know, sort of a billion dollars in revenue on the high end, maybe like $150 million in revenue on the low end. And what that means is it, it takes a lot to really break those businesses because they have a lot of revenue. And so we can make a lot of tiny mistakes and still not go out of business. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's a, it's, it is a little bit of a different perspective. I would say what I tell people is self-awareness is everything. I, too, in business school, found myself in the McKinsey interview process. And I actually ended up canceling my interview like the day before I was supposed to show up because I was like, I am not going to prepare a case study. Like This is never going to be for me. I love what I do because it's metrics driven. It's data driven. It's numbers driven. Like I can show my performance across all 10 companies. I can tell you exactly how they're doing, what they're doing. And if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, I can get to root cause of why. And I can help to fix it. I mean, I rely on my CEOs at the end of the day to get the work done, but I can tell you exactly which ones are performing and which ones aren't across all the different aspects of their business. Um, and for me, that's like what gets me super excited. As you guys can see, I'm like, oh, I love this stuff. Um, because that's just who I am. Like, I like data. I like numbers. I like control. I like to be able to fix root cause. Um, sort of like what Chris said about act like an owner. I'm the person who, like, I'm sitting in a conference room and all the phone cords are all messed up. I'm, like, looping them all and tucking them away. It's not my job. I just am one of those people who says, if it's broken, fix it. Mm -hmm. If it's not right, you know, I don't care whose job it is. Just take care of it. Okay. So this, is, this has been a great talk. And my colleague, Gina Resnick, is here from Columbia for Career Management. Gina, we have to show this to all of the MBAs, right, who think that this is a linear <laughs> line. So I want to ask a different question, because we don't have just all MBAs here. And you know, I, I guess you, maybe you can give some advice on this. Is that, you know, is it ever kind of too late? Do you ever say, you know, I, I don't really want to be an entrepreneur at 40, or I don't really want to start something? Can you tell a success story, maybe, of an investor that you, or you know, somebody who started something that you backed that started kind of later to, to give some oh, people some, yeah. I some mean, perspective? I, I, you know, it's funny. I have founders in their 20s, and mm -hmm. I have founders in their 40s. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if I have any founders myself, although I think the firm does, that are, that are you know, in their 50s. Um, but I, I don't think it's ever too late to start, to start a company. Um, I, I think what's unique as I, as I look at my portfolio, and I look at you know, I work with problem solvers. I work with early stage founders that identify a need in a market and have this burning passion to see something exist in the world that they don't believe is existing today mm -hmm. and or solve a problem in a way that they don't think is being solved. And if you look at the company is started by young people, oftentimes they're starting problems that young people have, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, there was a wave of, you know, apps that would help you locate friends and help you locate bars and things like that. If I look at the founders I work with that are particularly on the, the older end of the spectrum, there, a lot of them are solving problems they've had um, within their families mm -hmm. um, or problems they've, they've faced leading businesses over decades of their careers. And so they're bringing a very different, unique perspective to the table. Um, right now I work with a founder who has started a company in the senior care space, which is a huge market yeah. and incredibly important um, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, 10 years before that, he started a company for new parents, right? So a lot of his own uh, story as a founder has followed his progression as an individual. And so I, I don't think it's ever too late. I think your perspective continuously changes. And I think the more perspective you have, or as you find yourself in a different part of, part of life, um, there's something new that you can bring to the table as a founder. So I would never discourage folks that are that are older to think that you can't go solve a problem. In fact, I think in, in many ways, I think you solve harder and more difficult problems because you bring more life experience to the table. Renee, do you have any experience with any of your? Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think the biggest thing that I find that is different between a young, um, less experienced, founder earlier in their career versus a seasoned executive is really openness mm. um, and being open-minded and being willing to try something new. So what you tend to have with the, the less experienced founders is that 
they're just open to all sorts of ideas. And they, they have this belief that, you know, I don't know what I don't know, so mm -hmm. help teach. They are true learners. Um, and so what I would encourage, and, and that's, it, makes it, it makes it really pleasurable as an investor, probably also for Betty, to work with those people. Um, what I would encourage people who just have more experience, um, might have, you know, they might have worked for 20, 30 years, is to continue to keep that open mind. Because we can all learn from each other. And if you end up becoming really, really close-minded, it just you know, makes it really difficult for you to innovate for your company and even innovate for yourself as an individual. Betty, what yeah. about your operators? I would say, you know, we hire, so I actually do work with a handful of founders, um, but they've been running their businesses for quite a while in order for them to have gotten to the scale that um, is in my portfolio. But I hire first-time CEOs. I hire first-time CFOs, right? And at the end of the day, like, um, it's about, you know, it's about looking for new opportunities and um, for our openness to taking a chance on hiring the best talent. So when I hire a CFO or I hire a CEO, I'm not just looking for somebody who has that on their resume. Like, I mean, it's helpful, it matters. Like, I can't hire someone who is a developer to go be a CFO. There's some basic skills that you have to have in order to do these things. But just like Teresa and Chris, like people, you know, there's always gonna be that first step that you take in your career to get to that next step, and you have to be open to it. You have to look for those opportunities. I would say, because this is an audience of women, that a lot of times when I do recruit um, for executives, people get super focused, especially women, on did I do all these things? If I haven't been a CFO, right. I don't think I can be a CFO. Right. I haven't been a CEO before, so I don't think I can be a CEO. I need like five more years of seasoning to do this or that. That's ridiculous. Like, if you <laughs> look around right. and you think about the skills that you have and the and the ability for you to learn something new, that's what you should focus on. And that's what I focus on when I work with you know, first-time C-suite. It's like, do you have the drive? Do you have the ambition? Do you have the intellectual curiosity? And then and the motivation? And then some basic skills, right? So I would say put yourselves out there if you're somebody who is thinking about how to get to that next level or to make a shift in your career. So I want to ask you a question that I've always wanted to know the answer to. Uh, so, you know, I work a lot of MBAs, and, and, and some of them are entrepreneurs, and then I teach some of them in the second year, and they're not entrepreneurs anymore. Uh, so I'm <laughs> to, and uh, I'm wondering, so then I'm, now I've asked the question, how many people were entrepreneurs? I used to ask how many people are, and now I say are or were. And uh, how important is it to really have passion? Because sometimes I get the sense people say, oh, this is a money-making idea, but they don't necessarily believe that they have. I don't, do you know where I'm going with this? The passion. So maybe you can help me tease out something around this. Do you really have to be super you passionate? You have to be. I, I mean, it, it can be the world's most boring, dullest opportunity, but if you are passionate about it, like right. you need to be. I, one, I, the, I think the biggest trait that I, that I look for in my founders is grit and, and mm. kind of that. Literally the ability to like walk through a wall that is in front of you because it is really hard. And um, the number of no's and the amount of rejection that founders get, at least in the, in the venture world where you're going out to raise, you know, they start by raising half a million, and then I, you know, I come in for that two to three million dollar round, then you're going to raise another five to ten, then you're going to raise 20, 30, eventually, you know, when you do your growth rounds, eventually you find folks like these. Um, you are constantly getting no. Uh, you are constantly getting no from um, the people that give you money. You are constantly getting no from the folks that you want to hire that end up taking the job down the road at Google because the benefits are better and mm -hmm. the pay is going to be better. Like, you need to believe so fully in what you are doing. Um, and you need to convince so many people to get on that bus with you right. um, and to follow you. I, I think that changes as you get into more professionally run later stage companies. But you still need that passion, right? I mean, you still have to believe. And, and, and again, you can be making like the most world's most boring widget. But if you think that this widget needs to exist in the world, like if you don't, if you don't think it does, no one's going to think it does. No one's going to follow you. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And I think passion in whatever you do is super important. As you guys can tell, I'm super passionate about what I do. Some people might think it's super boring, but I think it is literally the best job in the entire universe. And I think that you know, for my CEOs that I work with, or my CFOs, or my CTOs, like their ability to sell the story first to themselves, and then to all of their employees, 
is what makes them successful leaders at the end of the day. Like whatever business they're running, you know, they, they, they work on financial clothes, right? Like, woo, it's accounting <laughs> software. Um, but, you know, if, if you can see the value beyond just like exactly what the software code does and you can get people excited about it, that's what's going to make your company successful. Because at the end of the day, it's a competition for talent, yeah. right? And that's a lot about what we're talking about here. And so if you can't sell the story first to yourself and then to your teams, then you're never going to be successful. And I, and I tell people, I'm like, you know what? We all work too hard to mm -hmm. do something we don't like, number one. And number two, the number of hours and the amount of psychic energy you put into it relative to the amount of money you make is like $2 an hour. So like you shouldn't focus on what the long term, you know, I might make a million dollars today. It's really about like do you love what you're doing every single day because you know what? Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose and you have to be able to pick yourself up and go after it, which comes from that true like belly check belief that you're doing something that matters. Right. Could agree more. If you're not passionate about your job, it's time to get a new job. <laughs> <laughs> Irrespective of the student loans and everything else. Okay. Yep. So I think we can sort of summarize this uh, section up by saying it's not about STEM, right? It's not about driving science and math and technology younger in the schools. It's really about finding your passion and and pursuing it and believing in yourself, having that, doing those things that instill confidence that are going to allow you to. Oh, STEM forward. is still important. No, STEM is still important. <laughs> But you STEM, is still important. STEM is still important, but I think we, we tend to see a lot of articles that say, oh, that's that's the solution. You know, if we just if they just learned science earlier. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you if you want to talk about women in, in technology right. and whether it's you know on the investment side or on the operating side, um, I think there we're you know we, we've obviously uh, seen uh, CS majors kind of fall off a bit of a cliff, mm -hmm. but some in general we graduate more women in uh, bachelor, master, and doctorate programs right. than we do men. Um, at this point, um, the more degrees are earned by women, it's about staying in, and right. it's not, and it's not necessarily, it's not about opting out to stay home with children at this point either. It is, it is about providing pathways and career pathways, and and, and finding finding jobs and pathways. So I, I think I think it's a very important. The educational piece is really important, but I think it's up to organizational leaders, men and women, to make sure that we are keeping talented women and nurturing their careers throughout. Um, throughout their careers, and and it is about you know if it's not happening where you are, um, I think it is about identifying whether or not you can long term be successful in that place or not, and that and that is really tough. It is really tough to make that switch, um, and it may and there may be times in life where you you do need to stay in places that are not optimized for whatever uh, personal reasons or financial reasons, but ultimately. Um, I, I think the onus is on business leaders to make sure we're keeping women in, and pushing women towards leadership roles as opposed to s seeing women get stuck and layered in organizations. Yeah. So, I was going to say, I, I actually, I really believe it is a virtuous cycle mm -hmm. where you know, fundamentally believe that having more female investors right. means more capital going to women-run right. companies. Um, it really is all interconnected. I mean, Pinterest is a perfect example of that. When Pinterest tried to go raise money, they really struggled in the beginning because they were pitching to a bunch of men. And so it's it's not a coincidence that Sarah Table, you know, was a female who originally sourced that deal for a VC <coughs> firm. And all those, you know, other firms missed out. It was a lost opportunity for them. If you think about it, I mean, 50% of the population are women. And so if you're not building products and, and you're not, you know, investing in products and, and services that address half of the world's population, you're really missing out on a huge opportunity. <laughs> so let me just, before we just leave this topic, kind of actually Renee spurred something. So how, Renee, then, do you keep yourself open? How do you circulate? How do you get out, and, and to Stephanie as well, and, and, and Betty, but you're more on the operations side. You know, how do you mix with those people that you normally wouldn't mix with, perhaps, is kind of what I'm hearing you say, to well, keep yourself open. What do you do? I, uh, it's, it's less about mixing myself and, and more about thinking about different strategies that you can employ mm -hmm. um, at your company. So one of the things that we do um, at, at Vista is really using assessments. 
to level the playing field. And, and what I mean by that is instead of um, having interviewers look at someone's pedigree, for example, which is the school that they went to or the brand names that they have on their resume, or even based on just gut, did I like this person or not? Because people tend to hire people just right. like them. Right. So right. rather than using those things, we use assessments um, that really assess kind of their aptitude and ability to learn as well as their personality fit for the role. And what and it's pretty incredible you think about it. What that allows us to do is a person from Harvard versus a person from a community college are going to be given the exact same opportunity for a single role. And actually, there's probably even a little bit of a bias now to the person who went to the community college, because we all know who's going to work a lot harder and who's going to be more loyal. And what, what you end up with when you do that, starting at the recruiting level, is that this really seeps into the, the mm -hmm. roots of an organization culturally to create a true meritocracy. Um, it is something that I've seen at Vista and all of our portfolio companies. It is why you know we have so many women at the top at Vista because of this true meritocracy that's created um, that that you know stemmed all the way from just a recruiting process. Stephanie, as you go and source things. And yeah, think about I mean, it. so my job, a good chunk of my job, is being out of the market and right. sourcing things. And 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 the and actually, the reality is most of the the deals that myself and my firm does, and, and these are companies coming through our network. So I'm cultivating my network all the time. Uh, it's it's not surprising to me that half of the founders I've backed this year are women, right? Uh, or last year, I guess we're, we only just started the year. Um, but in 2017, of the four deals that I did, two are female-led companies. Um, I didn't do them because they're led by women. Um, I invested because I think they're great businesses. Um, and in fact, neither one is a woman-focused company mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. I think they're great businesses. Um, it doesn't surprise me if I look across the portfolio of CEOs that I've backed over the last seven years that actually the vast majority are not, the, ma the, the majority of deals I've done have not been white male-led companies. Um, I don't set out to do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's just the, the type of founders that I attract and maybe the, the lack of faces that may, in my, in my broader industry, that maybe don't look like these founders and therefore there's comfort in working with someone or there's, there's the feeling that they're, I'm gonna look at those deals a little differently. Um, so you know, it doesn't surprise me that you know, having diversity at the table in firms changes the makeup of the founders that we invest in. We can always do better. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that I think a lot about is how do, how do myself and how do my partners measure who we're meeting? Are we meeting, you know, we, we are, you know, every year we go back and we look and we say, are there deals that got done that we didn't see? Why didn't we see those deals? Um, of course, we don't know if those deals are going to be successful again for years and years and years. Um, but certainly we can take a look and say, hey, you know, like our peer firms, you know, invested in this company. Was it on our radar? Did we meet with them? Did we pass? Um, you know, and then we look at deals that we passed on that other that other people invested, and we kind of keep track of our anti-portfolio. Um, and but I think there's always there's always room for improvement there. But but again, it, it, you know, having diversity at the table, uh, you know, when our founders see us backing a diverse set of founders, um, it means that they send us a more diverse deal flow mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Betty, how about you on the operating side? <sighs> So I think about, again, I talked about how I like to think about root cause of issues. And so for us, I think we look at the funnel too, right? So whether it's STEM, whether it's on the investing side, you know, we support an organization called Girls Who Invest, which is about trying to increase the number of women that are asset managers. Um, and we start at the freshman and sophomore college level, right? So it's very much about going as early as you can into building awareness. I think there's plenty of education, right? It's more attracting women to these roles that's really important. Because, I mean, I think 35, 37% of the um, people that work across our portfolio are women. We would hire more if we had more applicants, right? So it's really about, about building more um, more of a pool here so that when we get down to selecting those people, we um, have more choice. And if you look across our portfolio also, like these women CEOs that we have, I and mean, we have seven women CEOs in our portfolio, I think six of them were hires, one is a founder, but all you know, these six are women that we found in the market. Because if you are out there looking for the best people, you should always <laughs> look at the women as well as the men. And we found phenomenal executives who make us tons of money, thank you, um, who have Happen to be women, and I think it's, you know, it's about it's about sourcing the whole pool. Okay, so 
let's move to the second part here, which is what are the roadblocks? Because we're all sort of in violent agreement, the research and us here and the people here today, obviously, that having a diverse group matters and it just doesn't, it, it, and, it, and it shows up in the numbers, right? So why then in a business where we're looking at numbers and we're looking at returns, are we having still problems? Why are we still having, I mean, we were both in investment banking here and so investment banking still to a large extent is male and that's kind of a selling business. So maybe I can see that, you know, it's a little harder to, to evaluate people and people, as Renee said, hire people like them. But here where it's about the performance and we can actually measure it, why are we still kind of lagging, do you think? So there was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal this week about how it was about women um, joining boards. Mm -hmm. And yep. it talked about how there aren't very many female directors. Right. And they said the reason, the reason that they identified was that it's really hard for women to get that first director role. So I read that and I said, well, I actually think it's hard for everybody to get that first director mm -hmm. role, right? I mean, I'm not just gonna take Michael and be like, hi, would you like to be a director of my company? Like you've never done it before. I don't know what your skills are. So I, I mean, I think it's a valid point that you know, getting that first opportunity to be a director, to be a CEO is hard. It's hard universally, it's gender neutral. Um, but I do think that like in boards, a lot of people, you know, it's, it's, a, it's always been a networking right. sort yep. of sort of recruiting process Somebody where people, people talk to people they know, who know people they know, and that's how um, boards get created. And so because it is primarily male dominated and it's sort of the BWGs, right, like that's why they look the way they look. And you know, in our portfolio, as we've done, um, as we've started to invite external board members uh, to join our companies, we hired a firm and we said, we want gender diversity, we want ethnic diversity, we want all kinds of diversity. And so source us the best people in the market. We do not care if they've sat on boards or not. We want them to have skills that are relevant. We want them to have domain expertise. I mean, when I interview board members, first thing I say is, how are you gonna help my company make more money? Mm -hmm. Right, whether that's product, whether that's go to market, <laughs> like I don't really care and I don't care what you look like. Um, and so I think having that, um, to what Renee said, like we're about, you know, we're looking for a meritocracy. It's, a, it's capitalistic. I'm just trying to find the best people who can, you know, help us be the most successful. Venture is interesting because venture is really, really is such a cottage industry, and and unlike in an investment bank where you can you've got HR and you can put systems in place and, and interview processes that are very standard. If you think about venture, I mean, I work at a uh, my my current fund is a hundred million dollars, right? That feels tiny, I'm sure, to the folks on the stage, right? Um, there's three partners. Um, that's it. That's our team. We've got a, we've got you know two folks on the operations staff, and th we were a team of five. It's not like we add people every year. We're not we're not a growing business. We're also not a business where um, where there's going to be open slots in the future. Mm -hmm. And 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 so when you think about venture, whether you're a smaller fund like a seed fund like what I run, or even even these larger funds, you're still talking about firms where there might be five or 10 partners, maybe 15 partners, maybe spread across two offices. So you're not talking about a lot of job opportunities. Um, you're talking about very heavy pyramid structures where the vast majority of the jobs are long-term partner level. Um, you're talking about a little bit of hiring at the kind of analyst, associate. Uh, there's actually very, very, very few um, kind of post-MBA non-partner roles out there. In fact, that's, I think, the fewest jobs in, in venture. And so the, the opportunities are not you know, open all the time. They're generally sourced through individual networks. It's not, you know, maybe, maybe some firms hire recruiters, certainly small funds don't. We don't have huge budgets. And so um, for the industry to change, it really takes, it will take time. And I, and I, and I see hope and promise that when I joined, um, I could count on my hands the number of females I knew leading funds or who were partners at funds. And the other night I had the opportunity to be in a room with over 100 women in venture in San Francisco, right? It's, and, and so when I see in a short span of time how many more women are getting to the industry, I'm, I'm given hope. But the reality is we don't have some giant governing board mm -hmm. for the venture capital industry that's saying, hey, we need to interview this many women or this many underrepresented people of color um, and this position, you know, we don't have that. And so it has to come from individual 
partners and individual firms stepping up and recognizing that diversity is needed around the table. And ultimately, I think what's going to change it for my industry will be producing returns. Right. When we demonstrate that we're producing better returns because we're making better investment decisions and we're backing better founders um, because of that diversity, that's what's actually going to move the needle. I think one of the biggest roadblocks I see is the fact that bias is actually subconscious. Right. You know, most, most people out there don't consciously try to be biased um, against genders or against certain races. And, and the problem with that is because most people then don't even realize that they're the problem. And so to combat that, uh, I'd say you need to design structures to help prevent the bias from seeping in. Um, and you need to call people out on it. And, and what I mean by kind of preventing it from seeping in is set up processes. So for example, like an interview process, actually give your interviewers criteria that they need to check off versus go with your gut, thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, because that's where the biases will just naturally seep in. In meetings, we've all seen it, where there might be a male colleague who ends up mansplaining or <laughs> interrupting or steamrolling the conversation. Well, set up ground rules ahead of the meeting. That, you know, chances are they're not doing it on purpose. In fact, you know, my husband is my number one fan and biggest supporter, but he sometimes mansplains me, and it drives me crazy. But he doesn't real like he's not doing it on purpose. He doesn't even realize he's doing it, and so I call him out when he does it. Um, and if he and I were working Working together, I would, you know, before a meeting, I would say, let's in this meeting, let's make sure we let every single person finish their sentence before, mm -hmm. you know, jumping in. Set up the structure, you know, help them help you, because a lot of times people just don't even realize. It appears to me that diversity also brings some operating overhead in terms of getting consensus, right? So diversity itself means that you have people with different opinions, different perceptions. They see things differently. I see a lot of frustration in business when people do. It could be a very valid contribution, but if but it takes then discussion, right? In the meeting, it takes consensus building. I feel that a lot of business executives, whether they're men or women, but mostly a lot of men, right? They just don't have the patience to manage a diverse group because it's a lot easier, mm. right? When everyone thinks the same and looks the same and acts the same, you can actually implement top down pretty quickly. You can't do that if you treat everyone equal and value diversified opinions. I'm not sure if there's any research in Columbia about this or if there's any anecdotes you have. You know, how do you overcome that impatience to, to try to get people to live through the middle part of that story so you can get to the end? That's where my personal failures always seem I mean, to be. I, I work with, again, I work with companies at the very earliest stages, right? One of the things that, that I think is incredibly important and I think how we do move the needle too is it's very easy when you're a team of two founders and, and now you're a team of three or four people for the team to be based on your individual networks. Again, you're kind of selling this idea and yourself, and so you generally sell the people that know you and will get on but with you. But it's incredibly important for those very, very early companies to start adding people that are different to their teams at the very earliest uh, moment that they can because the longer you wait to add your first, say, female engineer, the, it's going to be much harder to add her to the team when there's ten of that. When there's ten, when the, then versus when there's five, right? So um, I, I don't actually think it's that hard. I think people think it is hard. It might mean in the beginning you have to expand your your pool a little bit. But the reality is, I think can, I think quality candidates. Um, pay attention to who's in the interview process. I think quality candidates pay attention to who's walking into the boardroom. And so it, it, it's, you, you have to get over that mindset that it's hard, but it also starts from day one, whether day one is a, a newly formed company or a newly formed team in an organization. I think, I think you have to, to have that mindset as you, you start out because it's a lot harder to change it once, it's, once the, the culture is in place. And we use culture as an excuse for not making these changes. Yeah, and I think there's a difference between conflict and diversity and alignment, right? And so something that, I mean, our management teams are enormous and our companies are pretty big. And so something that we make sure that we instill in the culture of the company formally, like we do an executive development offsite for new leadership teams because we're always forming new management teams, is to force them to go basically do a workshop on constructive conflict and confrontation with each other, right? Because Alignment means you're all marching towards the same goal. 
conflict means like I call you out when I don't agree with you or I think you're making a mistake. I think those two things, actually, if you have both, that's the perfect mix. And I think if you're a leader that doesn't like conflict and doesn't like that discussion, like you're really not a very effective leader. And that, for me, is the greatest because you know it's incumbent on me to find really great leaders uh, to run our companies. And if you can't handle that, you're not going to work for us. You might work somewhere else. But I don't know what you think, Renee. Yeah, I actually think it's just a management style. So as a leader, I think you should go into every decision knowing, do I actually want to solicit feedback, or have I already made my decision, and I just want to entertain people? And so, and, and, I, and, I, think, and I think going into it, I think you should actually make that clear. There's going to be cases where you really want to you know, arrive at the, the answer together, and give those, and you need to present those opportunities for your team, and then there's going to be times where you don't have time to kind of do all this debate you know with your gut instinct you know what the decision is and you're willing to kind of hear some people out but it doesn't really matter you've already made your decision and make that clear and so you've got to do a balance of both versus every single time make it all about you know a democracy so my question to you guys is when you first started fund how do you set up a process um, regarding sourcing to evaluating investment opportunities um, on your own, but also at the same time get the leverage from the, the larger organization and get support uh, from them? For me, it is just all about being as resourceful as you can. Whenever you start anything, whether it's a fund or a company, you've got to tap into all your resources. So for, for me, that's investment banks, mm -hmm. calling on my network, looking at LinkedIn, calling on leveraging my husband's networks. I mean, you've got to just use everything because you've got to be scrappy. Um, and then in terms of leveraging kind of the, the larger institution, just don't be afraid to ask. People want to help. They know that if you're successful, they're going to be successful as well. And so just don't be afraid to ask. Marsha asks, um, how do you change the structure and culture of work in tech companies to enable men and women to integrate their personal and work lives? You know, I, I think it's again. It starts with it starts with leadership. Um, I one of the companies I invested in last year is this company um, helping um, called Carrot Carrot Fertility, and it helps companies bring fertility benefits to organizations. And that's not just benefits for women. That is benefits for anyone who thinks they may want to have a family today or in the future. Um, and I think it I think it means an awful lot to a transgendered employee to know that they have the ability to access the same benefits that a heterosexual couple that's been diagnosed with infertility has, right? So it starts at the top. It starts with things like benefits. It starts with policies that allow for, if it's right for your organization, flexible flexible working hours, right? And so the, the management and leadership kind of sets that tone for what, for what the companies can do. And those norms come from the very top. And I'm sure yeah. it doesn't matter, again, whether it's a large company like you work with or a small company like what I work with many, in many cases. I was just reading an article in Harvard Business Review about, uh, I think the title was, so you're successful, but you still work 70 hours a week. <laughs> and it, it had this concept of insecure overachievers. Um, and some of the comments made today about how women, in order to prove that we're you know, worthy, we have to often outperform our male counterparts. So how do you think about managing burnout in yourselves and your teams in that context? If you just look at me, I've got three strikes against me. I'm female, I'm Asian, and I look really, really young. Um, and so when, when you compare... <laughs> um, <laughs> That was good. <laughs> and, and so it, it is true. I have to work 25% harder than my you know, average male, white male counterpart to just prove that I am as smart, as capable, as competent as he is. But I'm OK with that, because I believe that sometime in my lifetime, you know, these biases are going to disappear and they're going to go away. And when that goes away, I am actually going to be perceived as 25% smarter, more capable, more competent. And they're going to get left behind. And that's what drives me and that's what motivates me to, to work harder. I don't, I don't get burnt out by it because I just have this passion and belief that we're actually going to be a lot better than, than our counterparts. I mean, I think we're super fortunate 
we are, that we all work in you know, financial services. Because at the end of the day, results matter. Right. right. And so whether you work 25 hours a week or 95 hours a week, at the end of the day, like I can point specifically to my results and outcomes. If I worked in a creative field, that would be a lot harder. Um, and it would be hard for me to demonstrate why I'm doing this or what that means. So what fuels me is not sort of insecurity or trying to prove myself. At the end of the day, I'm about delivering results and outcomes. And if that takes more or less on any given day, that's what I do. I do think that you know, early in your career, you do have to demonstrate that you're better. And you, sometimes that means working harder. Sometimes that means working faster, smarter, whatever it is, in order to, to overcome some of the biases. You know, there is that there is that need as you get more senior, as long as you can consistently demonstrate outperformance, I think that um, it's less about the hours and more results. And then the other thing I would say about that is, you know, people in the old days, people used to talk about work life balance and what I say is like it's my holistic life, right? right? right. Work is part of my life, sleep is part of my life. Um, <laughs> all of those things, every on any day, like you're trading those things off. So it's not about balance; it's about sort of what works for you on every, any day, you know, day, week, month, year, um, and how you handle all of the juggling priorities that you have. 